Welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And uh, today my guest is Haley Jones. Hi, Haley. Hi, Melinda. Thanks so much for having me. So you're you're hailing from Tallahassee, Florida. That's right. I am working out of Tallahassee this week. Well, thank you for joining us from down there in the South. Um, so let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Um, Haley Jones is the Vermont and New Hampshire State Director at Slingshot. She is a community organizer, interpreter, and queer poet based out of Burlington, Vermont. As a founding member of Slingshot, she works side by side with frontline communities to tackle environmental injustices and build the world we want to see. Right? That is a pretty noble resume. Yes, it is. Um, so Haley, talk to us a little bit about you growing up in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, wow. Well, I grew up in the Willamette Valley, so right between the Cascade and the coastal ranges on um, Chinook land, unceded Chinook land. And um, it was really, really beautiful. But I ended up leaving um, to go to Vermont because I was such a huge language nerd and an environmental studies nerd. And I wanted to go out to Middlebury College to study those two things. So, um, so I still have really. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to you know, talk a little bit about your childhood and growing up and what got you into environmentalism. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Who inspired yeah. you? Yeah. Um, who inspired me? Honestly, um, when I was in my teens, my family got toxic mold. Um, and so I had done, of course, all the learning that you do in high school environmental studies about climate change and about water pollution. And I felt really concerned about that, but I wasn't necessarily seeing that like impact me and my community personally at that time. Um, but when my family got toxic mold in the house where we were living, that was really an eye opener of, of seeing how we felt so powerless and so isolated and really that we didn't know what to do. And, you know, we did have some privileges, right? We were homeowners, um, or at least my parents were, we had some access to healthcare. And so we did end up getting the help that we did, but it just took a really long time and it was an incredibly demoralizing experience. And that was really my first kind of for into the world of environmental health specifically and, and how that can impact families. How did your parents figure out that it was mold that was causing and what were the, the, um, the, the you know, your health issues? Yeah, I actually, I mean, I came out relatively unscathed. It was really my mom and my sister who felt the, who took the brunt um, of the impact. So some respiratory issues, fatigue, um, triggering of a number of chronic illnesses, um, especially for my sister. And we actually had numerous people come out and test and scrape and check everything out. And we were just in the dark about it for at least a year. Oh my heavens. So did they, re re did they do remediation? Yes, they did, but we ended up having to move out and my mom has gotten better, but my sister is still living with all the complications. Oh dear Lord, I'm so sorry. Um, well, and then what brought you to Vermont was you got, you went to Middlebury, right? I did, I did. And, and no, ask, ask away. Mm -hmm. And so um, you worked at the Community Action Work uh, alongside community groups to protect their environment. This was an earlier position of yours. Oh. Uh, what type of issues were you working on when you were working with the Community Action Works? Yeah, so, I mean, just for context, in Middlebury, right, you know, great school, um, really good ties to the community, and I was learning about, right, learning more about all these big interlinking issues of oppression that affected me and my people and my community, and so... I would write these stunning essays um, about all the problems of the world, right? And then we would end the essays with like one paragraph about here's some potential solutions. And I've just found myself getting so frustrated and thinking, okay, like we understand more or less the problems that we're facing. How are we translating all this theory into action? So that 
that is that was my impetus. That was what pushed me towards really wanting to learn the ropes of rural organizing. Um, you know, volunteering with Migrant Justice, taking that entry level organizing position at what was then Community Action Works um, five years ago. And we worked on all sorts of issues across Vermont and New Hampshire. I spent a lot of time supporting community groups on campaigns around landfills, um, often leaching toxic substances, garbage juice. Um, I, sp I did some work on um, pesticides, uh, especially in lakes and rivers. Um, and then was also uh, working with a group down in North Bennington, not only around the PFAS contamination in their wells after the St. Gobain fiasco, um, but on these bomb trains that come and park and are just full of explosive uh, fossil fuels. So pretty much, pretty much anything that affects like public health and environment, we worked on it. You were involved in it. Um, now you did serve on the board of Migrant Justice. Um, tell us about that organization that you worked on. Yeah, and I'm actually, I'm still, I'm still on the board. I'm the board coordinator of, of MJ. Um, and you are, you serve on the board. Yes, you are on the board of Migrant Justice. Tell yes. us a little bit about that board service. Yeah, um, so Migrant Justice, you know, was really where I learned that organizing could be not just a chunk of your life, but pretty much your whole life. Um, they're the first people who I started volunteering with, you know, like driving farm worker leaders um, to actions, doing child care, doing dog care, um, going to membership assemblies. And I, they're the reason I fell in love with this type of work. Um, I'm also bilingual, so that's very helpful if you're working in Spanish. Um, and I have been really honored and excited um, to be able to contribute to the organization as I've become a better organizer because our board, you know, we're called a support board, right? Because Migrant Justice, the staff and the leadership cohort of people on the front lines, right? Spanish speaking immigrants who have worked dairy, who've worked construction, who are living these experiences um, in Vermont, they're the decision makers. The board's job is to pool our combined expertise in organizing and healthcare and lawyering and nonprofit work to support the mission of Migrant Justice. So honestly, my job on the board is to convene everybody, you know, organize everybody, help facilitate our meetings and make sure that we're um, just carrying forward the organization's um, mission in Vermont. Well, here, here. Thank you for that. Thank you for your service. Um, so you're an interpreter at the Open Door Clinic. Where is that located? Ah, the Open Door Clinic is um, in Addison County, uh, Vermont. So Middlebury, um, actually about a mile from the college. And, and, and you and you go in and you do interpretive work. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I do you want more information about that. Yeah, I do. I'd love to know more about open the open door clinic. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I got involved because um, I was part of the Middlebury Spanish program and um, I've been hearing about the open door clinics work for a couple of years. I had a number of friends who volunteered there or um, used their services and the clinic's awesome. They are their real goal is to support folks who are under or uninsured um, in getting access to healthcare. And they have just this whole like myriad of organizational partnerships um, to make sure that people get the services that they need. And so one of the important things, and this isn't directly environmental justice, but it's language access, it's language justice, right? If you're going in for a doctor's appointment and the provider doesn't speak your language, that is gonna be one miserable doctor's appointment. So. I started taking these interpreting classes through the Open Door Clinic because interpretation is not only about your language skills, which are super important, they're about the ethics and the process and making sure that you are faithfully saying what the patient and the provider are saying. Once again, totally fell in love six or seven years ago. I've been going in whenever I can and supporting at clinic. And I really, really like doing um, appointments, especially for like trans affirming healthcare um, with, with queer folks, um, just like making people comfortable so that they get the, they get the treatment that they need. Thank you for that. You have your, you have your hands in a lot of different pots. Now let's, let's, let's uh, segue over to Slingshot. You were a founding member of Slingshot and you're the state director of Vermont and New Hampshire. For my viewers, um, you can go to www.slingshot.com org to their website. Um, Haley, share with us a little bit about the mission of this organization of which you serve. Yeah, uh, happily. Um, for a little more context, Slingshot actually 
came out of community action works. So all of our all of our founding members used to work there together, and you know we loved the work and really wanted to be able to build the kind of organization where both our staff could organize for a lifetime and we could train up folks from our base. And if they wanted to organize at Slingshot, they could too. So our, our real vision um, is where we as organizers are working alongside communities who are most impacted by environmental health threats, whether that's those bomb trains, whether that's PFAS in the water, whether that's you know places like the Merrimack Coal Station, we are getting people trained up with everything that they need to build out their vision of the world they want to see, identify the pathways they can use to get there, and then win. And we also want to work ourselves out of our jobs, right? Like, I'm not here to speak for people. I'm here to work with folks until they are super powerful. They've got their groups running and they're doing the work themselves. So you've achieved hundreds of victories during your years in the environmental movement. What do you consider your greatest victory? Oh, if I don't know about hundreds, I'm not, I'm not very old, Melinda, but um, All right. let's see. I'll say dozens. Dozens. Or a couple of hundred. Dozens. Um, what do I feel most excited about? I found this on All... hundreds of victories. So, and knowing <laughs> you, I figured you could easily have achieved hundreds of victories, but. No, have... you're right, though. In total. Um, in total. So, talk to me about some of your greatest, vic your greatest victories. Yeah, happily. Um, you know, something that we're really, really excited about and that a lot of our leaders have been really excited about um, is a twofold both designation of two big PFAS chemicals as hazardous substances under so the super. Yeah. Explain what a P, 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 yeah. Explain to me. Absolutely. Um, PFAS is the abbreviation um, for something that we think of as toxic forever chemicals. They're hyper present, uh, over 12,000 different types, and they're used in a lot of really common commercial and industrial products, whether that we're talking about um, rain gear or snowboards or your Teflon pans. They're also used in a ton of manufacturing, textiles, firefighting foam. The companies that manufacture these PFAS, they've known they're hypertoxic to human beings for a long time. It's just that we've only been discovering their presence and working to eradicate them and to regulate them for the past eight or nine years. So what does PFAS stand for? Uh, per and polyfluoroalkylinated substances. It refers to their chemical structure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, is, this was before my time. I'm not taking credit for this, but my predecessor actually got the call about PFAS contamination in wells down in North Bennington in 2016. And so essentially Slingshot was one of the first groups to be working with local folks on this horrible, horrible contamination. And out of that work, we formed this national PFAS contamination coalition of groups across the country who have been living with this pollution to fight for a number of things, but regulation as a class, uh, cleanup of impacted sites, um, often medical monitoring for impacted folks, um, and maximum contaminant levels, which is where the federal EPA says, hey, you cannot have more than X parts per trillion of these really harmful chemicals in your water. And we're gonna need you to take care of that if you do have it. So our groups have been fighting, working on this for eight years, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. I've worked with folks, um, particularly in the South of New Hampshire, in the South of Vermont. And this past month, we got two huge victories with the EPA setting those maximum contaminant levels, which is huge, unprecedented. And then also designating two of those chemicals as hazardous substances under the Superfund Act, which gives us some real teeth to regulate and clean up these sites and also gives us access to funding and um, legal hooks that we didn't have before. So once again, that is not me saying I did all this. It's just saying I was honored to be a part of it. And it's just like such a testament to the work of all the leaders who we've been with in the past couple of years. And it was a victory. Oh, yeah. Two huge victories. And they have implications for Vermont and New Hampshire. So what are the two most dangerous uh, toxins? Uh, the big ones, and I'm, I might have to fact check myself on here. It was PFOA and PFOS. I can't tell you the full chemical names of those. Those were designated. But 
there are only two of over 12,000. Of over 12,000 toxins. Correct. That are all the same chemical class and all have similar impacts. So what we need is to regulate them as a class. Right. Well, congratulations on those two victories. That's amazing. So thank you. Thank uh, you. You talk a lot about and the things I've read about you about building community power. That's pretty much what you do at Slingshot. Talk to us a little bit about how you build community power. Totally. Very loud truck, one second. All right. So I always tell people this, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a lawyer, right? I'm also a generalist. I work on a ton of different issues and the only thing I really specialize in is campaign strategy and leadership development. And so often what will happen is I'll get a call. Okay, loud, very loud truck. Um, I'll get a call from someone. Um, I'll say just recently I got a call from someone in Ashland, New Hampshire about a waste to energy incinerator. And this person was super worried and was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? How do I stop this really dangerous proposal and get something actually healthy and good for my community in its place? And so the first test of organizing is we want to see, can we get people in town excited and evolved? Because they're the people who have a real interest, right? They're the ones who are going to be impacted by the fumes coming out of this facility um, and like the environmental health impacts that it's going to have. So we do a lot of work on building groups that are really efficient and have a vision and know where they're going. We do a lot of workshops with our groups as well. With that, whether that's like campaign strategy or crafting a really good honed message or doing grassroots fundraising or working with the media. And then I also do a lot of just like one-on-one -on -one calls where I'm like, all right, like we're writing this op-ed. You've never written one before. What is this going to look like for us? And just get you geared up to go. And I guess the last thing I'll say, and I'm getting too excited about this, we work really locally. That's super important to us. But we also know that like people are facing similar threats across the region. So we connect groups to each other in this kind of ecosystem of hyper local grassroots groups so that people feel less alone. Right. Um, and they feel connected to our to other folks who are doing the same type of work. So basically Slingshot in, in, engages and empowers the communities to go out and advocate and fight for themselves. Absolutely. And it's really it's really a matter of, hey, we're here. We're supporting you as you tap into power that you already have. Right. We're not giving you anything necessarily, but we are walking with you on this journey. We're training you how to do it. I mean, a lot of people Absolutely. don't know how to be active. So exactly. Kelly, how do my viewers interact with Slingshot? Um, are there volunteer positions? Uh, of course, they can donate to all my viewers. Go to www.slingshot.org. I believe there must be somewhere on your site where they can make a donation. Um, how do communities engage with you to get involved with them as they fight against environmental degradation in their towns? Great question. Yep. Great question. Thank you. Yep. First of all, donating, especially if you're not impacted by a pressing environmental health threat. Um, we also organize money, right? So there is a there's a yellow donation button on our website. We're always happy and it goes directly to our organizers salaries right we're not out here buying yachts or anything um if you are living in vermont and you're living in a community um where there's a pipeline proposed or you've discovered you know well water contamination you can go straight to slingshots website you can find my contact information my email and my cell phone um, are both there and you can just reach out to me um, and say, hey, I'm working on this. Can we chat on the phone and see how we can work together? Thank you. Um, yeah. And then the last thing I'll say is, even if you're not part of a most impacted community, but you have experience and expertise, if you're an environmental lawyer, um, if you've done a lot of public health, like academic stuff, we have a network of environmental justice experts with whom we connect our community groups when we need that really specialist knowledge. So you can also sign up to be part of our EJAN network and you can just contact our info account um, to become part of that as well. Fabulous, thank you so much, Haley. So right now your organization is working with more than 40 communities across six states, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Connecticut. Um, are you planning to go national? Not right now. So you're gonna stay regional. We've got our hands full, we've got our hands full. So share with us a story about one of the issues you're tackling right now. Mm. Mm. I'm 
I'm actually going to use this to help help group build right now, Melinda. Um, so down in North Bennington, um, we've seen year after year uh, these oil trains, bomb trains, um, park on an abandoned rail spur right in between two mixed income housing complexes. And this is a really thorny issue um, for a number of reasons, but essentially rail and fossil fuel are working together. They're throwing their weight around. They're trying to scare the town of North Bennington, who's already been through hell. Um, but we actually have found a couple ways that we could at, very, at the very least um, put up some resistance um, to this threat and call for you know, actually sustainable health protective sources of heating. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to track folks down in North Bennington who are up in arms about this, who don't wanna see like this risk of explosion, this risk of leakages and seepages in their neighborhoods. And I'm trying to help pull a group together. So if you know anybody in North Bennington, um, put them in touch with me. I'm really trying to get a group together in town. Well, it's so interesting because at Main Street Landing, um, the railroad, the state and the city wanted to put a second rail line right in right in front of our project, which has housing and retail, performing arts center. And it took a year and a half, but we fought them and we be, and we won. I mean, they wanted to park the diesel Amtrak overnight and clean out the toilets and service it and everything right where people sit and watch the sunset. So we had to take them on and everybody said, you'll never win. How can you beat the state, the city and the world? Well, we did. So that's the kind of work that you do. And I'm very proud of you. So, um, uh, what type of, um, let's move on because we're running out of time. I could talk to you forever. What is a horizontal organizational structure? Oh, that is such a great question, Melinda. And it's one that we are constantly asking ourselves. Essentially at our old organization, we were required to have a pretty hierarchical structure, um, which, you know, it's great if you have great people in leadership, which we did, but we found that we were reaching bottlenecks. So with a horizontal structure, we have our goal is really to have this peer to peer mentorship system where organizers are working together to kind of troubleshoot, you know, challenges that we're having with campaigns um, and to make sure that we're getting all the training that we need. And so we do have co-executive directors and an organizing director who hold a little more responsibility within the organization but they are not all powerful. They are accountable to other members of the organization and to our board. So we just flatten out the leadership model a little bit so that there's less of a concentration um, at the top. Don't you think, do, yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanna say, don't you think that women do that anyway? I mean, um, women, women manage in a very lineal way um, where, I, I mean, I don't, no offense to men, but men tend to, be more managerial top to bottom. I found Oh, my we can do Yeah. No, I'm I'm very comfortable offending men. It's something I do every day. And I've been it's been really special to be a part of this um very queer um very queer organization. Mostly women and non binary folks are in leadership positions and, and founding positions and, and that feels really exciting. And also like that tends to be the organizing world I've, I've found. And we have some men on our team and they're absolutely delightful and they are so bought into the horizontal structure. Well, we love I, saw, them too. I saw your board. Um, yeah. And I, and, I'm, and I managed Main Street Landing at a horizontal, that's why I want you to talk about it. Where they're, um, but uh, I saw that Paul Burns is on your board and I served on VPIRG with him. Um, so uh, we're running out of time and I wanna get into some personal stuff and I have time, I'm gonna go back to the F-35s, but um, as someone who is young, relatively young, and facing a world of devastating climate change, what is your prognosis for the future of our species, Haley? Okay, all right. Um, the short answer to that is I don't know, but, and I find this motivational, other people might not, if we're going down burning because of the crimes of the US empire and their allies, I want to go down fighting and organizing and I want to make sure as much as we can that the people who have been hardest hit in the past and continue to be hardest hit, you know, our, our black and brown and native communities, um, women and queer folks, uh, immigrants and refugees. I want to make sure that we're at the very least reducing the impact on the front lines. So the answer is, I don't know, but 
I'm going to be taking action with people for as long as I can. And that's what keeps me going. Well, good for you. I hope you live to my ripe old age of 74. And you're still not doing that old. It. Because I'm still, I'm still fighting the fight, too, um, at my age. Um, so are you concerned about the future of our democracy? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I have all the respect in the world for both our electoral organizers and our folks who are working to protect democracy. It's not like the most central thing that Slingshot does, but a lot of our work we're running up against this, right, of like who gets to have a say in determining their own futures. And so it's inherently part of our work. So, yes, I'm concerned. Yes, I know there's a lot of great organizing going on. And I've seen the results very recently in Burlington, Vermont. So it's not a silver bullet solution, but I'm feeling really excited about it. Good. So share with me. These are all these things I wanted to ask you when we had lunch together and I was able to get my thoughts on paper. Share with me. Um, well, this is new. Share with me your thoughts about the protesting that's happening around the country in our colleges and universities. Um, so I went to Middlebury College yes, um, and seven years ago, uh, a lot of students on campus said, hey, we don't want the pseudoscientist and eugenicist Charles Murray to come. And they protested. And the college administration, I'm not talking about individual staff in solidarity, but the college administration basically said, oh, we meant fight for justice, but not in that way. And so when students are protesting to end the genocide in Palestine, um, which is, you know, it's a racial justice issue. Um, it's a climate justice issue. It's just a humanitarian issue. And administrations are saying, oh, we didn't mean for you to cause us any inconvenience or to threaten the status quo. That's not, that's not acceptable. Um, young people have almost always been on the right side of history and protests 50 years ago were as contentious as they are now. And we're in full support. You don't need to tell me that I marched with Daniel Ellsberg against the war. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, they're comparing what's going on now with our generation. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you for that perspective. Um, so what is the most important thing the top of your list humans can do to protect our planet? Oh, I'm going to. I'm going to say this. I do believe in individual choice to some extent, but I really, you know, I'm, I've, I'm sold on organizing. I'm sold on joining, you know, your local chapter of, of climate justice orgs that exist or pulling together your own if, if one doesn't exist and um, bringing more folks together because not all our decision makers are always listening to us. Um, but I do believe that we, we can make them. So I say it's organized. Do you believe our country will eventually tackle the issue of income inequality and are humans capable of ensuring that everyone is cared for? Oof. Um, I am not an economist. So this is more theory than practice. That's There's okay. going to be a loud sound. That's good. Um, I... One second. <laughs> it's an ice cream truck. No, it's the Sweet Master. It's a street sweeper. Uh, oh, tell us to really have a big Tuesday. Um, um, I'm going to say two things. The first is I have to believe that we can to keep going. If I didn't think that level of sleeping and honestly very reasonable change uh, were possible, I wouldn't be doing this job. And the second thing is, I'm interested to see how much we'll have to change to make that possible. Because honestly, I think capitalism in this country is functioning exactly as it was designed to. So there's going to have to be some tearing apart and building back up before that can happen. And I feel excited about it. Well, Haley Jones who is the director of Slingshot for Vermont, New Hampshire. I encourage my viewers to go to www.slingshot.org and learn about this organization. Well, hey, Ellie Jones, I, the minute I met you and we had lunch together, I knew that I wanted to have you on my show. I just love the way your mind works. I love the work that you do. Um, I, think, I think that you're really making, I really think that you're making a big difference in our world. 
in an our state. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I believe you've got a, a tremendous future ahead of you. And so I want to thank you for your time and your wisdom. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank, thank you so much, Melinda, and thank you for, for giving us this platform. You know, it's, it's not just us as organizers, it's, every, it's everybody we work with. Absolutely. I'm honored to have you on my show. Well, we'll talk soon, okay, Haley? You got it. Thank you.